uh, of our discussion. Uh, I didn't give you the three, two, one, did I, David? <laughs> he started the recording. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for this time in the middle of the week that we can gather together and, and spend some time in your word and discuss some things. And we're thankful for uh, this technology that we can use uh, to get together. And we pray that you'll bless our discussion tonight as we, uh, as we move on through this process of looking uh, and studying what it looks like to be reconciled on a day-to-day -day basis. Bless our discussion in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, oh, T, that's not going to work. So, sorry, I had to take care of some housekeeping around here. So, uh, so we're doing reconciled. We, we this is week three. We did, we spent the first week doing the introduction, and we spent the uh, uh, last week doing R. And in the R, if you recall, if you're taking notes, was simply this: recognize that we are not God. And we talked a lot about playing God, and, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in review, but I, I, but I do want to add one thing. Uh, I, I looked at it mostly from the standpoint of playing God in uh, trying to run the show, uh, of trying to run my life and, and trying to run your life, you know, <laughs> trying to run my kids' lives and, tr and trying to get involved at church and make sure everything's there. So I looked at it from playing God from a standpoint of, of running the show. And, and I think that's valid. As soon as we logged off and as soon as we signed out, it dawned on me that, that I, I, had, uh, I, I didn't say something that I want to say. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I, but I want to say this. In terms of playing God, let me add one other thought to that. And that thought is, is when it, we have to somehow, on a daily basis, stop trying to decide and determine what should and should not happen, or what's right and wrong. Now, I don't mean right and wrong in terms of morals. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty black and white on moral issues, but let me give you an example. A few days before New Year's, my college roommate and good friend was in Erie, Pennsylvania with his family up there, and uh, he was walking down the street and had a major cardiac event, and, um, and it was really strange because he was on the sidewalk in Erie, Pennsylvania, and the man standing beside him was an off-duty paramedic. So he was on him immediately rendering aid and CPR. The ambulance got there in less than five minutes, and the hospital was only two blocks down the street. So if you could ever have a perfect scenario for having a heart attack, Ward had the perfect scenario. And, uh, a few days, and he never woke up. Uh, on New Year's Day, they withdrew uh, life support, and he passed. Uh, when it comes to playing God and right and wrong or should or should not, I determined, because I know best, that that should not have happened, that that was wrong, that this man died. I mean, he had, a, he had three teenage boys at home that he was raising. So it should not have happened that this man at 56 years old died and left this woman at home with these three teenage boys. And I determined that that's wrong. That shouldn't have happened. Certainly, I thought that true when my mom died. My mom died when she's 44 years old. I don't know what y'all think about that. I think that's a little young. So I determined, in my best thinking, that that should not have happened. It was wrong that she died. And what happens is, in terms of when I start doing that, and when I determine what should have happened or what should not have happened, is I'm playing God. And when I do that, I put a layer of suffering on top of that that lasts longer than the original grief would have lasted if I had just gone through the grieving process. So I determined that Ward shouldn't have died. And I've got, and that was wrong. So now I've got to work through this wrong suffering before I can ever get to the grieving process. And my mom dies at 44. And I determined that should not have happened. And I and I apply a layer of suffering on top of that, or pain and suffering on top of that, that lasts longer than if I had just gone through the grieving process. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. I really want you to think about though, in terms of us playing God. Because what happens is, is I don't get, when I'm playing God and I'm in the middle of it, I don't get the view from the Goodyear blimp. And that's what God's got. So he's got, he's got the overall view. And he's in control. And since I don't have that view from the Goodyear blimp, I'm right in the middle of it. And I'm determining right and wrong and should and should not. 
and it's just further exacerbates the problem. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Well, week one was recognize that we are not God. The study is about what it looks like to be and to live reconciled to God. So on a daily basis, on a daily basis, I have to R, recognize that I'm not God. I'm going to read a few verses to uh, open up the E tonight before we get to the E. Uh, and I couldn't really determine which one I like the best. So we're going to start out in, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 9. I think David's got these. He's going to throw them up. In Matthew chapter uh, 9, starting in verse 35, it says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I love that. And it's interesting that my whole life, when we've when I've read this, you know, I'm a lifer, I've said it before, you know, my entire experience in the church is, is we only read this, we only read this because of the, the, the paragraph heading. And if you recall, the paragraph heading says the workers are few. Because the next verse says, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So whenever we go to this text, all we talk about the fact is, is the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few and we've got to get out there and get into the harvest and get into the harvest. And it turns into a big guilt trip about the fact that we don't have enough workers to go out and do the harvest. And that's the only reason this verse is ever read. And we totally, in my estimation, miss the point. It's not about the workers being few. It's about our Savior. It's about Jesus. And it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So what it does is it gives us a real view of what Jesus was thinking. It gives us a real view of why he was here. And Jesus was here and he was out there and he had compassion on these folks. He felt, he felt for them. He had empathy for them because they were, they were harassed and they were helpless. And it really shows Jesus' heart. It really shows what he was about. Linda Landreth actually brought up the, the next one to me. She was talking to me about it one time, and it's in Matthew 23, verse 37. And, it, and again, it's about Jesus and, and his heart. And in Matthew 23, starting in uh, verse 37, it, and I'm just going to read the one verse. It says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So you just see Jesus, you know, as we said in Matthew 9, he just has this heart of compassion, and these folks are harassed, and they're helpless. And then in, by the time he gets over several chapters over in 23, he's just going, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You know, it's almost like he's crying. It's almost like he's in tears about it. And he goes, how long, how, how often have I longed to just gather you up the way a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you weren't willing. And we see Jesus' heart. And, and we see what he was about. And we see the, the, the compassion in his feelings coming through once again. And then the last verse, and I'll just turn over it, turn over to it, is in First Peter chapter five. And starting in verse six, I'm just going to read verse six and verse seven. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Verse seven. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And that's going to get us to the E. So in light of those verses, we got recognized that we're not God. And then we get to the E in our study. And the E is simply going to be this. The, this is harder to do than it looks like. The E is going to start with an adverb. <laughs> And the E is this, I recognize I'm not God, but E, I earnestly believe and come to know 
that God desires a relationship with us. I mean, we have to believe that, first of all, and then over a period of time, we come to know that God really, truly desires relationship. He desires that for us, and, and, and I think that's very clear in Jesus' life and what Jesus was doing. Now, once again, it seems like a no-brainer, right? I mean, just like last week when I brought up the fact, recognize we're not God, and, I'm, and I see some of the question marks above your head, and you guys are going, Kevin, is this really a problem? And I'm going, yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, it really is. And, and I get to hear why I talk about re really believing that God desires a relationship with us, that God wants to be involved in our lives, that God desires to be in the, involved in our lives. And I know that some of you are thinking, well, Kevin, that's a no-brainer. I mean, that's silly. We all know that. Is, it, is that really a problem? Yes. Yes, it is. And I'm not giving my opinion on that. I'm giving an experience because of the number of people I've talked to every day. And, and part of this ministry of reconciliation that we're involved in. Now, I will say this. It may not be for you. I mean, this may not be an issue for you. I mean, you may be sitting there thinking, listen, from the time I was two years old, I was raised by godly parents. I was raised in the church. I have always understood. I have always known beyond the shadow of a doubt that God's grace is good for me, that God cares for me, and that I'm good with God. And I have all, and you may be thinking that right now. And if you are, praise God for you. I am not going to question that if that's your experience. I'm really not. I will suggest this. You're probably in about one in the in the one percentile. You know, you're a unicorn <laughs> if that's your story. Because I folks, I'm in the streets with folks every day. I'm in the, I'm in the streets with Christians and I'm in the streets with non-Christians. And I think. The truth of the matter is, is that folks really struggle with that. I mean, in general, folks really, really struggle with the fact that does God even care? Is God even, in, is he involved in my life? Does he want to be involved in my life? And as we continue into this, and we'll eventually get to the D, where we're going to talk about this being our ministry, uh, the, the original text talks about God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Some of you may have been there in Carrollton a few years ago when I, when I preached about that, that God only gave us one ministry in the whole Bible. There's one ministry, and it's the ministry of reconciliation. And as, you're out, and as we're out dealing with folks and talking to folks, whether it be in, at lunch with coworkers or whether it be at lunch after Sunday service with Christians, these things come up. And here's my experience, especially with folks out there, is they simply don't won't or can't believe it they, they just can't believe it that god really desires that relationship and the encouragement is is it reconciled people that not only do we believe that but that we know that and i encounter them all the time and i encounter i encounter non-christians and and i encounter christians that 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 struggle with this issue so so let's consider you know, the, the two or three different scenarios. I mean, because I mentioned already, you may not be in this class of folks. You, you may be in the class that's always known and it's never been an issue for you. God's always been there, right there for you. You've never felt far away from God. You've always felt God's presence and it's been that way your whole life and praise God for you. And, and what a blessing, what, 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 what a complete blessing that is. Um, but there's a second one. I mean, you may be a lifer like me. And, and have seasons, seasons in, in your life where that's just not the case. I mean, I'll give you an example, and I don't want to be, I don't want to be too outlandish, but, but I'll just say it. You know, someone suggests that I had a drug problem when I was a kid. Because uh, I was drugged to church every time the doors opened up. <laughs> you know, we were, we, were there, we were there on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. Uh, on Monday night, when Dad was in the school of preaching, you know, I was involved in that study. Uh, I told you uh, I bragged about memorizing most of the book of James. I'm, I'm taking some of the same classes Dad's taking. And I wasn't begrudging. You know, I enjoyed that. It wasn't like I didn't like it. But I'm a lifer. I've always been here. But this is a pretty... Uh, 
this this was a pretty tough place. We were up there for two years. You know, they had two lectureships the two years we were there. One year, the lectureship was living righteously, living soberly, righteously, and godly. And the next year, the lectureship was moral issues face the kingdom. So they, let's just say they, <laughs> they, they had an agenda of what they wanted to talk about. And, and, and for the whole time we were there, it was just about moral issues, period. Name, it, name it, anything you want to name, and that's what it was about. And they did it two years in a row in their lectureships. So I'm 12 years old, and I'm going in there every time the doors are open, and I'm going every Sunday morning. And, 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 and folks, I'm just going to say this. The man wasn't saying this. He wasn't saying what I'm about to say, but I promise you this is what I was hearing. Because a man would get up every Sunday behind a pulpit and he'd have a little suit and tie and he would talk about some kind of moral issue, smoking, drinking, dancing, or whatever, you know. And it seemed like to me every Sunday he was talking just to me. And he was saying, Kevin, God loves you. You have no idea. You can't even comprehend the love of God. Kevin, you have no idea how much God loves you, comma. And by the way, you're going straight to hell. Now, the man didn't say that. I promise you, he never said that. But that's what I heard. That's what I heard. I heard that I'm trying to serve a God, and I just don't have a chance. There is no possible way on God's green earth that I'm ever going to be able to live up to what this Christianity is requiring of me, of what I've got to do. And folks, I know I'm not the only one because I've talked to too many of you. I've just talked to too many of you. You know, and then there's those that may have come to Christ later you know, that know what it's like. I mean, we talked about recovery in the first week. I, I compared and contrasted recovery and reconciliation. And I would suggest this, that we're all recovering from lostness. You know, you know, everyone in this, everyone here tonight is recovering from some sort of lostness. But there are those that come to Christ later on in their lives, and they, they understand that. They, they, they know what it's like. They know what it's like to be out there. And I talk to these folks all the time. I got a good friend that's still on his journey. He's not a Christian. He's not named Christ yet. I, I think that's in the cards for him. I pray that's in the cards for him. But as a non-Christian who's who, who has struggled with some demons and battled some demons, let, let me tell you what he says. He says, I woke up every morning knowing three things. I knew, number one, that I was not enough. I knew, number two, that I was never going to be enough. And I knew, number three, that everybody knew that I was never going to be enough. And he said that was the major theme through his life for years and years and years, that I'm not enough and I'm never going to be enough and everybody knows it. This is just what I am. So he's so far away from God as he can possibly be because he, he's just not enough. And, and I'm not going to call names, but there's people in here tonight. There's people on this screen that I'm looking at that have shared with me that there were times in their life where they felt of a certainty. They felt of a certainty that God was with y'all, that God's grace was for y'all, and that his blessings were for y'all. But God's grace and God's love and God's care just doesn't apply to me. It just, it, it, God has given up on me. Which really circles back to the first week of recognizing we're not God. Because when I'm in that spot, what am I doing? I'm playing God. And that's what I said last week. I mean, it's so easy to look at some of the seasons of my life and some of the things I've gone through and say, what's well, real simple. What should happen is God should look down and say, look at Kevin. Kevin's had every blessing in the world. He was raised by godly parents. He was raised in the church. 
He was a missionary kid. There's only one person on this screen tonight that's knocked on more doors than I have, and that's the old man. I have knocked on some doors, folks, thousands of doors. <laughs> I've been in the mission field. I'm Christian college educated. I basically minored in Bible. I've had every blessing in the world, and yet there are times when I've turned my back on God and walked away from God, and I know what should happen, that there should just be a bright light and just Kevin, just a greasy spot left in the middle of the street. And, and that goes back to playing God and completely understanding that there's no possible way that God will help me. There's no possible way that God will intervene on my behalf. God has given up on me because I have just lived too much rebellion. And, and I have that experience. And, and I know that some of you in here have had that experience too. And certainly as we practice this, and practice the ministry of reconciliation with non-Christians or people that are out there, I can promise you, I can promise you they feel that way. They just feel that God is just a foreign thing to them that's never, ever going to be involved in their lives. So as reconciled people, we get up every morning, we recognize we're not God. And secondly, earnestly, believe and i think believe and i and i put it in here believe and come to know that god desires a relationship with us that's a whole different study i've got the i've got the shell of a book started uh about believing and knowing uh, the title of it is i'm no longer a believer that may <laughs> that may get you thinking about it but i think that we first have to believe we first come to this belief that God really does care and that God wants to be involved in my life. And through a period of trial and through a period of maybe uh, testing God, uh, did I say test God? Maybe testing God or giving God some things and seeing him come through and seeing him come through in those situations. Do I switch from believing to knowing? So I'm no longer a believer, folks. I'm a knower. We're going to talk about that on uh, February the 14th, uh, if you can make it. We're going to talk specifically about making the jump from believing to knowing. Because I think that's key. And I think that reconciled people may start off believing. But as reconciled people, we know. And the scripture is crystal clear about that. What does that mean, though? I mean, how? And, and we'll finish up with this. At, at, at its base, at its very base, how do I know that God desires a relationship with me? I mean, how do I know that? I actually heard a preacher on the radio. I was, I don't, this was years ago. And I, and I was running on the radio, and this preacher said, he said, do, do you realize, do you, can you comprehend how far to what degree God is willing to go to get you to conform to the image of his son. I mean, just how far is he willing to go? How, how far is God willing to go? Because at the end of the day, when I'm trying to determine whether or not God desires a relationship with me, whether God's grace has afforded me, whether God wants me to be in relationship with him i always by logical deduction i have to end up at the cross i, I mean the question naturally lands me at the cross and the answer is is how far is god willing to go how, how far is god willing to go to get me to act right Well, he's willing to let his son come down here and spend a few years walking around with a bunch of people that really didn't get it. They never did get it. And then he's willing to let that and let his own son get murdered. He, he's willing to let him get beat nearly to the inch of his life. And since the beating didn't kill him, they went ahead and hung him on a cross and killed him. That's how far God's willing to go. God is willing to let his own son be killed in order to afford a relationship with me. 
to give me the opportunity to have a relationship with him. And folks, that's, that's far. That's, that's the nth degree. And as reconciled people, as a reconciled person, that has to be paramount, paramount in my mind. It has to be paramount in my mind at seven o'clock in the morning. I wake up that I recognize that dear God, thank, thank you for being you. And I'm thankful I'm not, you know, but, but, but father, I know that you care for me. I know that you have compassion for me. I know that you want relationship with me and, and your son proves that everything about his life up to and including his death proves how much you desire that relationship with me. And that's the second principle. That's the second principle of earnestly coming to believe and earnestly knowing that God really, really requires, desires this relationship. As you know, I've put this under the, the realm of living and being reconciled. Uh, Larry's putting it under the realm of, of using the Bible to solve everyday living problems. And, 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 uh, and, and that's fair. You know? <laughs> To just throw the problem up there. If you want to look at it from a problem standpoint or under that umbrella, it certainly applies that when these daily living issues come up, number one, that I'm not God, number two, but God cares. He cares. He has compassion. He knows that I'm harassed. He knows that I'm helpless. He knows that I can't do this by myself. He cares. And that's the second step or the second principle in living reconciled and handling living issues uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm gonna ask David James to unmute himself and uh, close us out with prayer in a few minutes. But I do wanna say this before we do that. Folks, this is real encouragement to me. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know what the count is tonight. Uh, looks like there's 20 boxes lit up and there's some folks in here that's, you know, there's two in a box. So uh, the attendance is up once again. It's an encouragement to me just to see your smiling faces. Hopefully I've said something that can be encouraging to you. Uh, sometimes Sunday to Sunday seems like that. And then sometimes Sunday to next Sunday is a long, long time, you know? So uh, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm grateful that we have this, that in the middle of the week, we have this forum, that we have this place we can come to. And uh, you encourage me, I'm hopefully I'm encouraging you. And I just encourage you uh, to follow along with us. Next week will be C. We're gonna move on in the reconciled study. And uh, I appreciate you being here. So, David, if you'll close us out. Okay. The Father in heaven, we are grateful for the opportunity to assemble in this uh, format in order to um, to be exposed to this idea of the reconciliation that uh, you have called us to. We appreciate uh, the work that and thought and prayers that Kevin has put into this. Uh, to put together something which helps us logically work through the, uh, the challenges we have with our own uh, our own minds, our own souls, our own hearts in terms of accepting uh, our relationship with God in an appropriate way. We pray to the Lord that uh, all those who are assembled here will continue to uh, participate and that we can grow together as Christian brothers and sisters as we continue in this this study. Thank you so much for this opportunity. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good job, Kevin. Thank you. Good job. Thank right. you. Good night.